What's up, ham fam? Welcome back to another episode of Hard as a Mother. Um, I'm so excited to announce our first ever sponsor, and it's a dope one, as you can see. Um, so today's episode is brought to you by Tiger Milk, which is a creative studio and print shop that partners with local artists and brands providing creative consulting, branding, and merchandise. So bring your creativity to life and get at Tiger Milk on Instagram. That's at uh, tgrl.mlk and slide into their DMs. So if you're new and you're just tuning in, we are Har and Jizzy. Hey, Uh, Har. Hi, Jizzy. And we are just two moms on a mission to create a safe space to, for moms and dads and pretty much everybody to share the honesty and the realness of parenthood while also being able to laugh at ourselves. Perfect. Well, hello, ham fam. Um, We hope to bring you another um, flavor episode to start your week. Uh, This week's guest is definitely going to bring up the heat and the spice. She is a sexual freedom philosopher, author of Dr. Seuss style book about orgasms called Ooh, take the places you'll go. Ooh, and ooh. girl, it's oh the places <laughs> oh, you'll oh, go. Oh, sorry, oh, guys. Oh. And <laughs> well, guys, I'm trying to put a little spice and flavor to that. Uh, and she's also a psychedelic journalist. Joining us from Toronto, we want to welcome Nicole Hodges. Hey, Nicole. Hello. How's it going? Good. Good. Thank you for joining us. And I love your attire right now. Feeling it. Thank you so much. I, I guess I guess people will be able to see a little bit, but I uh, ever since COVID started, I have fully embraced my uh, propensity to just live in nothing but silk robes. Hey, girl! I wish I could do that. Well, you know what? Since I've been working from home, it's literally either pajamas or like it's so liberating not to wear a bra all day. Oh, yeah. it's the best ever, yeah. and uh, yeah. So we just. I just let it hang when I'm at home. Can you get me a silk robe for Christmas? Maybe. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the, the silk the silk robe. I warn you, you will escalate quite quickly to suddenly owning silk sheets and silk pillowcases, silk everything. And it really is kind of a down. It's silk everything. Yeah, it really keeps you keeps you aware of your skin, which I find keeps me at least connected to my body. Well, oh. I own a silk, uh, silk pajamas and it's the best. So I don't usually wear the top. Um, I don't know why, but the bottom is so, it's, it, it, it's so, it's, there's just so much comfort to it. And when I'm like moving around in bed and I was like, oh my God, this feels so good. Maybe I should invest <laughs> in silk sheets. Well, exactly. There you go. Yeah. Especially during exactly. COVID because that's all you're going to be wearing. Um, So for our audience who doesn't know who Nicole is, I'd also like to add that she's the founder of at Girls Who Say Fuck, which we all know is Har's favorite word. Guilty, guilty. (laughs) And and at Men Who Take Baths, which is a men's mental health movement that's changing the culture of masculinity from the bath by interviewing men in a bubble bath and what it means to be a man. And we here at HAM are all about um, advocating for men's mental health, which is why uh, we wanted Nicole on our show. Yeah, so Nicole, this is like all amazing. I just want to ask: There's so much things you're doing. Do you even sleep? That's is that why you keep your robe on? <laughs> my, I do. I have great sleep in my silk sheets. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, uh, I actually, my roommate asked me this question today. She asked me when I sleep. I, I have just become quite efficient with my time. That's, that's all it is. Is I go to bed at a reasonable hour, I go to bed around 1130, I wake up around eight, sometimes even sleep in a little bit. And I just feel like when you're passionate about something, it's almost like you have jet fuel. You just kind of become really focused and know exactly what you need to do. And that's worked against me in certain cases where I become so enraptured by what I'm doing that I neglect other areas of my life. But I feel like since starting a uh, journaling practice in the morning and a meditation practice, I've become better at knowing when I need to recalibrate and, and actually slow down and, and go inward for a bit. So right now you're catching me in a time where I've recharged and so I'm I'm full force out in the world. And then once I kind of get the feeling again that I need to go in and nurture myself, I'll kind of regress and go into hibernation mode for 
a couple of weeks at a time and, and recharge. So it's all about balance. So Nicole, how do you know when you need to, um, cause I have that same problem is that I feel like there's just so much things that I'm doing that there's one part of my life that is lacking or once it, it's just never a balance. One's always too heavy than the other one. Like, how do you even know, or when do you recognize that? And how? Mostly when I mostly when I disconnect from my body. Mostly when I um, don't prioritize intimacy with my partner, or I'm kind of plowing through life and I'm not feeling any sense of pleasure. Um, and and I think that's what eroticism is. It's really being able to find pleasure throughout your day. It's actually not strictly to do with sex or anything sexually related. It's just the pleasure that you take in being alive, really. And so I find that when I'm getting to a point where I'm actually pushing myself too hard, um, I'm disconnected from the joy of just being here. And I need to I need to go back within myself and I and I need to slow down. And I think something beautiful about feminine energy especially is we do express ourselves best when we are lower and intentional Mm -hmm. um i don't think we're meant to adhere to um a standard of constant output i don't think that's where our power comes from i think what we can do is set a new standard for how things can get done that also allows you to slow down and nurture yourself and make love and notice beauty yeah i agree let's get rid of that nine to five shit (laughs) i'm trying to do that oh it's completely unnecessary yeah Mm -hmm. it's completely unnecessary Mm-hmm. So I want to start from the very beginning. Um, so you call yourself a sexual freedom philosopher, which I love. Um, so thank you. Tell us a Completely little bit made about up. Yeah, <laughs> made up or not. It's amazing. So tell us about um, how you be how that came to be. Like, do you think uh, anything in your childhood has played a big part with what you're doing today? Wow, those are big questions. Um, <laughs> First of all, I will answer the first one a little bit. Um, A sexual freedom philosopher is the byproduct of my need for a title. And I was, so I was doing all these things in my life and they didn't have it. They didn't have a name because a lot of the things I'm doing haven't been done before or haven't been done in the way that I'm doing them. And I recognize my obsession to have this. This, this job title and so I was speaking to somebody one day and they said well just make it up and so the term sexual freedom philosopher was born and I am the only one that exists who has this title I, I want others to exist and you know that that will be a life mission is to you know create a space where more people can identify as a sexual freedom philosopher but it, it's kind of a it's a laughable matter for me because it's like I took a deep breath after she said that and I was like oh okay, now I can continue doing what I was doing, but nothing had changed except for the fact that I had this like arbitrary title, which for some reason in my brain encompassed everything I was doing and now validated me. So that's kind of, it's kind of a joke, but um, <laughs> at the root of it, what is a, what is a philosopher, right? A philosopher is somebody who is on the quest for wisdom and who prioritizes dialogue over debate, which allows room for, curiosity right so it's it's a practice of the pursuit of wisdom and uncovering truth by constantly questioning the way we've been told life is supposed to be and so for me when I say I'm a sexual freedom philosopher I'm acknowledging that so much of what the world is today is not actually uh, applicable or liberating for our sexuality Mm -hmm. and for equality and I believe that sexual equality is imperative for gender equality and it's Mm -hmm. imperative for Mm -hmm. the liberation of so many things. So that's kind of what I'm doing with this, with this quest, this title, whatever you want to call it, of being a sexual freedom philosopher, Um, asking people to constantly question things that are established, the virginity campaign being one of them, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. Um, And then your second question about my childhood, um, is there something specific? Because that's a that's a Pandora's box right there. Well, we're just talking, uh, like every episode we always talk about how 
the things that happen in our childhood shape us who we are t- today, right? And like, um, if something didn't happen in your childhood, would you have realized this um, total shift in mindset where you're like, oh, I need to, I, I want people, I want the world to know that it's not so cut and dry. Do you know what I mean? Like tapping into your creativity, oh, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Uh, so there was a moment when I was 15 years old and I would say it was the turning point that had a ripple effect for the rest of my life, which was I was standing across from my mother and she was screaming. And my mom was a incredibly mercurial, violent woman. And I grew up in a rather tumultuous household. And I remember looking at her and it's almost like she was moving in slow motion. And I said to myself, if I do everything the opposite of her, I'll be happy. And the opposite of my mother meant not doing any drugs, um, graduating from high school, and choosing not to have sex with more than, at the time, it was five people in my, in my entire life. But I, you know, eventually changed that to ten. <laughs> but it was still, it was an arbitrary number. But for me, it represented a rebellion against this person who had brought me so much pain in my life to that point. And that served me really well for a really long time until it no longer did. And the second place, I guess the bookend to that in largely the creation of who I am today speaking to you is years later at the age of, I believe it was 27 or 28, I had to have a conversation with that 15 year old version of myself and I felt like I met her at a gate in my mind and there was a huge open field and this this gate where you could clearly go on either side of it but I I refused to and I walked up to my 15 year old self standing at this gate and I said to her like it's okay you kept me safe this long and the promise that we made we did it and and look at all of that space on the other side of shame and all of that I want to go explore but you have to let me go and we hugged each other me and this 15 year old version of me and she left me go and the gate disappeared and so the person that you're speaking to today is someone who is frolicking in a field of flowers on the other side of shame um as you're saying as you're saying that you hugged her Mm-hmm. And you've come to terms with it. I'm literally getting goosebumps because yeah. I don't think, I can only speak on my behalf, but I mean, I'm going to sort of generalize it. I don't think women, when they look at their childhood or even their 20s or 30s or 40s, can ever come to terms of letting go of certain things. And like you were saying in what you're tra- uh, teaching and practicing is um, really getting that pleasure and joy, not just based on sexual, like a sexual thing. Um, How could you, what kind of advice could you give to women on how to get to that point? Or is it more like they got to do their own deep work. But if I was sitting here watching this, what could you, what advice would you give them to get them to that point or even go into that direction? Mm, That's a good question. I feel like, so it's so individualistic for everybody right because my story could it's not the same as somebody's but they might fear this and they might resonate with something mm-hmm. I said and I think that where that wisdom can come from because I, I truly believe and I wrote this in the book you know the answer is in you you are the key like the character in the book oh the places you'll go oh oh set out thinking that the answer was outside of themselves and they had to go find it. And that's a really good thing because you have to set out on that pilgrimage, believing that there's something out there for you to find. But the true journey is coming back home to yourself with the realization that the answer was always in you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, there's this, there's this roomy quote that I actually have interpreted a little differently and it, it goes, you know, what you seek is seeking you. But I think about that and I was like, what you seek is seeking you as in you. Mm-hmm. It's, it's asking you to find yourself. And so I think that exposing yourself 
to new experiences and ways of thinking Mm -hmm. and women and podcasts and consuming content becomes a mirror where you might find a little piece of yourself that helps you start to figure out what doesn't fit any longer. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing that's been really beneficial is um, I've been doing energy work lately and this woman helped me find pain points in my heart that were almost unresolved, like things within me that I was using to protect myself that were actually now holding me back. So I think it's, it's okay to seek outside help in unconventional ways. Mm -hmm. I think a big thing for me was I thought that by seeking therapy or energy work, that that somehow meant that I had let myself down. I had let that girl, that little girl down, that I wasn't able to keep her safe and protect her. Yeah. But me doing the work now is me protecting her. It's me going back to those places in my past Mm -hmm. and putting my arm around her and hugging her and grabbing her and telling her like, come on, there's another way. Mm -hmm. And that's really impactful because I feel like if we hadn't recognized that either, that there's that little girl inside of us that's telling us that we're meant for bigger things, that we wouldn't even be here right now. Absolutely. Do you find, uh, I get, this might be a little bit of a loaded question, but do you find that, okay, so Nicole spoke to the 15 year old. Do you feel like maybe when you get to a certain age, that when you're at that age, she's going to turn around and look at the, I don't know, like the 30 year old Nicole or the 25 year old Nicole and then say something to her? Or do you think this is just an aha moment to move you forward? Right. So I take your loaded question and I'd like to raise you a (laughs) very strange consideration. (laughs) What if time is not linear, but it's layered? I believe that. And, and I mean, I can only speak from an experience that I, that I've had two, two, two experiences I've had, but I'll only share one. I remember being a child crying on my bed, holding my teddy bear at, let's say, eight years old. It was young, around that time. And I was so, I was feeling such despair for my life and my living situation. And I remember feeling this presence at the end of my bed and these arms wrap around me. And it was me, as I am now, then telling myself Mm -hmm. that it was going to be okay Mm -hmm. and so let's say that your intuition which you can have at any age your intuition is your future self whispering back to you Mm -hmm. that means that there's no age that you lose that guidance it also means that we should start looking at our intuition as a skill that huh. the more we exercise it, the more we listen to it, the more we're honoring ourselves. Mm-hmm. I never listen to my intuition. Let's get that. <laughs> you know what? I mean, that's, as you, that's some X Men shit right there. No, I know. But the thing is, <laughs> I as you're saying this, I'm I'm thinking in my mind. I'm like, seriously, Harleen. Like, how many fucking times do you have to make that damn mistake when you know that if you keep doing the same thing, you're always going to get that same result. So I totally get with what you're saying. So Mm -hmm. as you're saying that, I'm thinking to myself, what is my next move? What am I going to do to change this? So no, it's what, what is your, what is your reluctancy to learn? What is your reluctancy to move forward? And I think a lot of the, our reluctancy or the resistance that we feel is fear. And what is fear? We're, it's, we're protecting ourselves from something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So having you, you know what to do. Yeah. Do That's true. Yeah. That's true. So having realized that, then do you always look for these nudges then, and and just listening to your intuition? Yes. Constantly, and this is how I practiced it. I would have these these days of yes, and I would set out with my backpack with a few things in it, so anything could happen, and I started biking or walking and I would I would I would follow my intuition completely I would go down new streets and I would go into new coffee shops and I would talk to people and for 
an entire day, I would listen to whatever my intuition said. And it led me into some of the most wonderful experiences. And it led me to some of the most wonderful people. And my intuition started getting stronger. And this is why I say with conviction that it is a skill. It is not magic. We are just not taught that beyond our five senses, there is something else to guide us. And I think this, again, is, and I don't think intuition is purely female, but I do think, in a way, it is something that we were given, right? Like, in the same way that men are inherently physically stronger, Mm -hmm. I believe that women are inherently more energetically in tune. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, so that's all great information. Now I, now I want to go out and I feel like do this. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now I'm like, fuck, everything that I'm learning and doing, fuck, I got to go all back to the Mind drawing blown. board <sighs> because I got a lot of work to do. Like yeah. I really true, like I feel like I'm trying to get into a path of myself and I'm sure most women or people in general. And now I'm just like, oh, okay, okay. I got this. There's just something I have to shift in order for me to get there. Mm-hmm. No, there's not. Start where you are. That's just another barrier that you're telling yourself that you don't already have it and that you need to that you need to do something to get to a place. You could start right this second. If you want, you can start tomorrow morning. Wake up and ask, what what can I do today? What message am I meant to receive today? And just listen. You know, meditation is really just at its core just just stillness within self yeah. to listen beyond the doubt beyond the noise beyond all of it and and I'm no meditation expert okay like I just meditation is just a new found thing for me really and and my introduction to meditation actually came by way of orgasm so that's how I discovered the power of these transcendent experiences Mm -hmm. but now I'm learning how to how to how to sit and be still and sometimes I get nowhere besides the awareness of how much mental clutter is in there and that helps me figure out the difference between being up here in my head and listening deeply to that little voice before everything else comes rushing in Mm -hmm. You, you can do that now there's nothing stopping you except for your own fear yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry. Uh, there's just something that is running on our. Um, can the boys hear us right now? Uh, Brian, can you hear us? Sorry. There's something that's coming up on our screen. Anyways, we oh, got that's to. Okay. I can't see anything. Okay. It's on our side. Um, anyways, we can keep going because this is yep. just a thing. Okay. Continue. Um, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit more about your career because you obviously had a really sure. long career ahead of you or behind you, I guess. Um, so we read that you were a former writer for BuzzFeed. Um, so did you find that yes. the content you were writing for them wasn't as hard hitting and impactful as what you're doing now? And is that why you left? Uh, no, actually. Um, my, my wit came from really um ctv i used to be a i used to be a television host yeah. for ctv vancouver mm-hmm. and um i was tired of being permitted to report on the state of the world without being an active participant in changing it mm-hmm. and i really got to the point where i was working towards my dream job you know i wanted to be an anchor one day and I saw that as a possibility, but I was so dead inside. And I just remember moments where people would point and say like, this is who you want to aspire to. And I was so disconnected from that, that I didn't actually feel like they were even talking about me or my life. And I was in a beautiful seven year relationship living in Vancouver, which was the city of my dreams. And, um, I felt nothing. And so there was a confluence of factors and, you know, a sequence of events that kind of led to the decision instinctually to set my whole life on fire and move across Canada and completely reinvent myself, start from scratch, start girls to say fuck as a beacon to just kind of find people that resonated with that message yeah. mm-hmm. and begin the slow process of becoming me. Yeah. And I, I quite enjoy girls who say fuck if you guys haven't you seen guys it need yet to follow it yeah on instagram it's at girls who say fuck 
Oh, and I mean, I. <laughs> fuck. That's this girl right I, here. <laughs> I, I pe- like everything. Every time something pops up or resonates with me, I'm always taking that shit. I'm always looking back at it and I'm reading it. I'm like, you're good. You're fine. Yeah. So even though we know that's Har's favorite word, <laughs> um, you describe it as an incubator for ideas that instigate change. So it's more of a gender equality thing rather than a an actual swearing thing. Right. So tell us a little bit more about that. Oh, interesting. I've never been asked this question before. More of a gender equality thing over a swearing thing. Yeah, I mean, I would say that it's a it's a declaration. Um, the, you know, being able to say fuck is, is I would say, in a funny way, uh, was considered unbecoming of being a woman. Um, and even, even using the word girl is kind of a play on um, – realizing how far we've come away from even using that as an identifier. So the whole thing is kind of like this poking fun at the boxes that were put in or the things that we're Mm -hmm. we're allowed to do or not allowed to do. Mm -hmm. Um, But the reason why I call it an incubator for instigating change is that, again, it is a philosophy. It's a way of being. It is going to evolve and has evolved since into something where you can find a little piece of yourself. So as I evolve and I grow, a lot of the content comes out of my lived experiences. Um, For instance, the orgasm book is published by Girls Who Say Fuck because I wasn't sure who was going to actually publish me. So I made it its own publishing company. (laughs) That's amazing. (laughs) Do you think... Um, Oh, sorry. Continue. Go ahead. No, no, no. Do you, no, no, no. You go, please. Do you think swearing is a learned behavior or is it just something like you evolve into something to be more expressive. I don't know. Like, do you think swearing is a learned behavior? Well, funny that with swearing, um, there's been studies done that even people that have brain damage will still remember swear words. And I think that it's one of those things that for some reason we just remember. Um, I've I've read some funny things like uh, F-U-C-K used to be written above doors. Um, to signify or to, to mean an acronym for fornication under consent of the king, <laughs> which essentially was when like kings would allow people to fuck or not in you know in their in their reign, um, population <laughs> control. But that's I don't new. think that's true. Yeah, um, <laughs> I I, th- I think really what it is and why we love profanity is because it can mean anything we want it to mean. It's a word that's completely malleable and within our control in any given circumstance, right? Fuck you and fuck me mean two completely different oh, things. Yeah. yeah, oh yeah. Fucking absolutely. Or calling someone a fucking fuck, you yeah. fucking okay. fuck. Okay, so, um, I, and I mean, Giselle even says that that's like my favorite thing. I swear like a trucker. And it's just funny because a lot of people say, Harleen, you swear too much. Or like, I mean, on previous podcasts, I'm like, F, 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 F. Like, you know what? I don't think about what I, it just comes out. You know what? And some people have made comments saying, you know, expand your vocabulary, Harleen. I was like, my vocab is just perfectly fucking fine. <laughs> so, I mean, I am very open, blunt. Sometimes I, when I'm thinking something, I'm actually speaking it out loud. And I was like, shit, was I, you know, or I'll be like, or oh, is that rude? So when men actually curse the same amount as I do, why do you think that it's okay for them? But when a woman does it, it's so appalling. It's not ladylike. Do you think it's still the case today? than it has been like a decade ago? Hmm. Also a good consideration. I would say that anybody that still even thinks the term ladylike is wildly outdated. Oh, yeah. Fuck yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry. To say that... <laughs> I mean, even to say that something like a word is better suited for a man than a woman and a word with such power behind it to somehow not be associated with like, um, or to be a woman means to not speak with a word that in and of itself mm-hmm. carries such weight and lands so hard or feels like an exclamation mark at the end of a point. Or, or a demand or a desire or 
a way to push back against something that's, that's not liked or that's not agreed with, to say that somehow that doesn't align, that, that word that means so much doesn't align with being a woman is bullshit. I agree. Thank, th- thank you so much for saying that. Yeah, because man. I know that... Um, I've lost some sleepless nights over it, which is <laughs> which is fucking ridiculous. But I know that I've gotten some feedback and I take a full, like I can take criticism as long as they're constructive and they're not just telling me I'm an idiot. And, you know, I can take constructive criticism and I've lost some sleepless nights over it. And I was like, do I be, should I, can, should I be my true authentic self or should I filter something that yeah, you know, like you, what you were saying, it's like, you know, you feel dead inside because you're just doing something because everybody else wants you to do it. I don't want to, I don't want to filter myself. This is who I am. And, um, you know, do I use it in the right context? Absolutely. I'm not going to sit in a boardroom when I'm trying to do something and say, Hey motherfuckers, you know, but (laughs) I mean, you know, but when I'm having conversations or trying to be really my true authentic self, I feel like a lot of the times I use that word for emphasis or I'm trying to make a point across or something Mm -hmm. yes because it's a powerful word i mean think of the it's almost someone once described the word fuck kind of coming out of your mouth like a caged animal it's this f that flies into the u and then it like it's just it's the the ck is it's hard it's like a bill exclamation mark saying it because it means something to you in that moment Mm -hmm. it's like a jolt of power yeah. And that's intimidating to people. Yeah, yeah. it is. Absolutely. Um, all right. So I want to get into the nitty gritty here, the good stuff. Um, so your book, Oh, the Places You'll Go, Oh, Oh. Not the way Harleen said it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what can we expect from it? And um, what topics does it cover? So it's a, a Dr. Seuss style book in the sense where I studied Dr. Seuss for about a year before I wrote it. And I looked at the way he, Theodore Geisel, wrote in a philosophical way that left a lot of room for interpretation and something that his readers could grow with and still find value in. And so that's how I wrote this book. It's something where you could come, you, you, you could approach it and come to it at any age and it would make sense. And Mm -hmm. what it really is, is a sexual journey from sexual debut, which is the rebranding of virginity to sexual debut, right? So it's like have your sexual debut and it goes through all of the potential things that could happen on your way to discovering that the answer is in you and you are the key. Awesome. And so there's, a few different kind of like flows that happen. And it's, I always say it's quite ironic, but the book doesn't actually have a climax. <laughs> but it instead we might encounter such as the shaming place mm-hmm. where people are just shaming, shaming for the clothes you wear, mm-hmm. how you grow your body hair, shaming for all the things you've tried and ignoring all your reasons why. What do you think is hot? Everyone is Shaming and they shame quite a lot. Shaming because they can't admit that on your face they'd like to sit. And <laughs> I love that. There's just <laughs> the point is, is it's just supposed to show you these things that are true that don't have to be true for you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I want to talk about that concept of the sexual. And all the deb- strange, and all the strange people in place and, and things went. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I want to talk about the concept of the sexual debut. Um, so there was a quote that you posted yeah. on Instagram, which I loved, which read, the concept of virginity was created by men who thought their penises were so important, it changes who a woman is, which when you put it that way, is so fucking true. <laughs> so when did it strike you that you wanted to rebrand the word virginity into sexual debut? I feel like when I was looking at language and the language we use, the word virginity was so embedded in our cultural lexicon that we didn't even really understand the implications of what we were saying. 
And so when I started looking at what does sexual freedom mean to me? And I started talking to women about sexual freedom. I realized that we weren't actually addressing one of the source issues. And one of the first pieces of messaging that young girls get, which is that, kind of like that, what that quote says, that you are defined by a moment of penetration mm-hmm. or that you are defined by what can be taken from you. And if we're talking about autonomy and we're talking about power and I want women to feel empowered with their sexuality, how is that supposed to be possible when we're telling them that they lose something rather than gain something? Yeah. Well, okay. So I just became obsessed with changing. I love it. The wording. (laughs) I love it. So um, I know that... Okay, so I'm going to be honest. So my experience with sexuality and sex in my early 20s um, was more catered towards men and not myself. It was the way the man felt or like if if I was good enough or did they feel good. It wasn't about me. So my worst experiences were in my 20s. And I feel like I only got that in my 30s. And that's probably why I hate doing certain things when guys ask when I'm in an in in uh like in a romantic relationship with them I was like I'm not gonna do that I'm not gonna do that and it's not because I just don't think I had a partner or anyone that was able to be to 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 make it I don't want to say beautiful I guess I could but not comfortable because I hated doing the one thing so I'm gonna I'm just going to say it, whatever. So like one guy would just always ask me to give him head. And it's like, I don't want to fucking give you head. So (laughs) even till this day, if I'm seeing someone, I'm like, number one, don't ask me for head. Because I feel like I should be the one who wants to give it to you because I enjoy it. Don't ask me because Mm -hmm. if you ask me, I'm not going to enjoy it. Like I want to be physically present when I'm doing that, that gets me off, that gets you off, and it's just going to be better. So do you think most women felt this way? And did you even feel this way in your 20s? And then like, when you realized it was about you too with pleasure? Like, did you feel that way in your 20s? Like, when did you experience like, hmm, it's about me too? Hmm. Well, I think coming back to that promise I'd made to myself, a lot of my sexual, I guess, encounters did happen later in life. And because I had this number, I was very choosy about who I allowed into my space. I always pictured it like I had a very small neighborhood in my heart. And if there was only 10 houses in this neighborhood, I'd be very aware of anybody that lived there. And for me... I never wanted to have sex with anybody that I didn't want to become or that I didn't want to have move into this sacred space. And I've always felt that way. And given, you know, the origin story, so that came from a place of defensiveness, but it did work in some ways. As for your experience, I think a lot of it is because we just, don't have education around pleasure. So a lot of the time, there's a performative aspect on both sides of sexuality where men don't really, I mean, men might communicate what they want, but it might be in a way that's not received, right? Someone might be telling you that, you know, they want, they want head from you because they're wildly attracted to you and they think that that would be a lot of fun. Now, if you felt great joy in doing that and giving pleasure, or that it didn't represent something where you were being subordinate in a way that you didn't consent to. Mm. It might actually be something that you enjoy. But again, we're not taught that in the same way where men aren't necessarily taught that going down on a woman is actually going to make sex more pleasurable for her, which makes it more pleasurable for him as well. Right. right? It's mm-hmm. just these, these things are denied to us. Mm-hmm. So we don't really understand how to create a mutually beneficial sexual experience mm-hmm. because it feels transactional, which feels limiting rather than it being about pleasure. It feels like it's a give and take kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Except yeah. for anal. But there's a, there's a, <laughs> hey, don't ask well, me for anal. I mean, well, I, 
Well, I was, God, I feel like I'm sharing too much on this fucking <laughs> no. podcast. But honestly, like, I'm, if I drink, fuck, if I drink, like, I'm, I'm like, let's try it. Let's do it. Cause I'm so relaxed and I'm not super tense thinking about it. And I'd be like, wow, yeah, let's do it. Let's try it. But if I'm not, and I'm not relaxed, I'm like, there is no way that's coming near me. Mm -hmm. Like it's, and I, I've heard a lot of stories where, you know what you like, it's like a beautiful thing. And, um, you know, how does one relax with their partner or is it more like it has to be an open communication between the two in order, it's kind of a trust thing. Well, of course it has to be a trust thing. You know, it, it has to be, it, I think respect is the most important thing that you can have mm -hmm. in situations of exploration, really, of anything. Um, I use the term, I, I mean, I, the word worship. You know, you have to, I, I feel like as a woman, you have to feel worship. You have to feel like, they are approaching you with this feeling of reverence and almost holiness. And I mean, my experience, which is not everyone's experience, but mine is that the more I'm willing to receive, the more I also experience. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's like, even in the case of, of like, let's say head or anal or anything like that, these things that could seemingly be one-sided. That's not necessarily the case, right? If you're, if you're flowing in your feminine essence and you're feeling powerful, like truly feminine essence yeah. is power, you know? If you're embodying that and this person is coming to you and you're, you're moving with their energy and you're, I don't want to say controlling it because you're not really controlling it, but you're the gatekeeper to the experience. When you give head, you are also receiving them. And so you're still, you're still in control. You know, you're still, the, you're still the one that's, that's required. And yeah. I, I don't know. It's, it's, yes, trust is, trust is something for sure. Trust and being relaxed. But are you and do you feel worshipped? Mm. Huh. Um, okay. So I also want to talk about, um, the other initiative that you have that you own on Instagram, which is men who take baths. Oh my God. I've been such a fan ever since I saw it. I was like, Oh my Cause you know, we're like I said here at ham, we're always talking about, um, men's mental health, men, uh, toxic masculinity. Yeah. That's like a recurring topic that we're always talking about. So, um, you started yeah. men who take baths. So it's at men who take baths on Instagram. Check it out. If you haven't seen it, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, so you started the movement after, um, the me too movement in 2017, um, where yeah. you were learning more about the masculine psychology. And so tell us a little bit more about that and how that came to be. Well, men who take baths came to me in a moment while I was in an airplane and I was looking down at all the houses and wall streets and the cars going by and the word sonder came to mind or the feeling sonder and that means that that feeling that you get when you realize that there are all these people living lives as intricate as yours that you'll never know and it was that moment that for some reason I felt like there was a missing piece of the conversation in the feminist movement and I turned to my friend and I said, we're going to put men in bubble baths and interview them about what it means to be a man. It was like it was in my brain so much that so much so that it had already happened. Like I saw the whole thing already. And we decided to reach out to the good men we knew and ask if they would participate in this. And they did. And it was, it was right around this time that um, the Harvey Weinstein allegation oh, came to yeah. light. Yeah. And you know, it was actually, I think it was like a week after we were set to shoot our first interview series for Men Who Take Baths, and, and, and Me Too really uh, took, um, kind of skyrocketed. And so what an interesting snapshot of time to have these men in this bath that have already said yes to this, and now Me Too is happening. And so I really got to frame the questions around feminism and how do we raise boys to be men who view women as equal? And 
what does it mean to be a man? And all of these things at a time where it was scary to be a man. Mm -hmm. And the whole project is about making sure that we don't lose the ability to communicate with one another. And I think empathy is the way to do that. It is the bridge between those things that we don't necessarily intellectually understand. We don't have to understand one another to feel for one another. And so this project is largely a feminist project in the sense where we get to see who the good men are, Mm -hmm. right? Someone has said, I think one of the most impactful quotes was, you know, we, this is coming from one of the men I interviewed is, we need some heroes. We have plenty of villains. Men aren't inherently bad. Mm -hmm. Men want to do well. And when Me Too happened, I knew a lot of these good men and they wanted to participate in the conversation, but they didn't know what to say. Yeah. So, um, when you get your guests coming onto the show, obviously they get into this bubble bath and they, they're obviously, they're pro, I don't know if they're petrified or like they're feeling like, cause they have to sit in this bubble bath and, uh, have a conversation with you. What do you do with them? Well, they don't, they don't have to. They don't have to, but what do you do to prep them or to be like, hey, listen, this is your safe spot. Do you think it's easier for them to be one-on-one with someone that like that's you or somebody that's one-on-one with like an intimate partner trying to like let them be vulnerable with them? Would it, Do you think it's easier to talk with you versus like someone, you know, you probably know most of them than versus talking to their partner about their vulnerabilities? Hmm. Oh, well, when I'm sitting on the floor beside the bathtub and this man is there, to me, the impact of this project is the fact that I'm taking a childlike activity and I'm infusing it with adult intent. And when the man is sitting in the bath, I think he relaxes more than he feels nervous. I've seen men show up with notebooks of pre-planned notes of things that they wanted to say and yeah. put it to the side and realize, like, it's not about that. It's about being honest. And a lot of these men haven't been asked these questions at all in this way. Being able to put my attention fully on someone in that position is to say to them you matter and what you say matters Mm -hmm. yeah and maybe it's easier to talk to an intimate partner but I think really what it is is the energy that I'm bringing and the energy is one of absolute acceptance which means non-judgment yeah Mm -hmm. so I just want to give everybody a little taste of how like I'm meeting them I'm meeting them where they're at you sorry go ahead sorry our internet connection is a little bit unstable so everything is kind of delayed so i i don't catch like the last tale of what you're saying okay do you want to finish that thought no 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 please go ahead oh, okay yeah so i just wanted to give everybody a taste of how intense these bubble baths are because i watched um how nicole prepares them Damn, and she i'm has, just saying <laughs> yeah it's crazy right like I've she has a giant them. whisk throws up what is it the lush bath bombs in there and just whisk the shit out of the bath and like there's all these beautiful big bubbles and it's better than any bubble bath that i've ever made that's for sure um but anyways hanging on my wall (laughs) do you actually it's it's iconic you should make shirts that have that whisk that i would wear that (laughs) um so what advice would you give men that are having a hard time getting in tune with their mental health and how to change the culture of toxic masculinity wow Those are huge questions. Um, Mental health is something different for everyone. So I think that's something that we're actively exploring right now through this, which is the ways that men identify with mental health, which I think is largely a new thing for them. Mm -hmm. Um, So we, we will become a resource to answer those questions and we will be able to provide help for men that want 
to have discussions with other men. We, we launched men's groups now, virtual men's groups. And we're, you know, we have our, um, our last one coming up. I don't want to use a date because I'm not sure when this is coming out, but Mm -hmm. you know, we, we cover, we cover topics like, you know, is sex fucking you over? So talking about things like pornography and intimacy and are you the man you want to be? Um, talking about performative masculinity versus truly getting in touch with yourself. And our last one is about, okay, psychedelics changed your mind. Now what do you do? So that's all about integration. So we're tackling topics around mental health from a bunch of different angles because it's such a, such a huge thing. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of your second question, which was, sorry, how to... Um, redefine masculinity how to change the culture of toxic masculinity where do we start well the first thing is recognizing that all masculinity is not not toxic Mm -hmm. and that the patriarchy is actually damaging for all of us it worked for as long as it needed to work and much like you know themes of letting go you can accept that something has been a certain way because it needed to protect something Mm -hmm. but this view of women's inferiority has been necessary to justify a version of male dominance that is no longer serving our culture, which right. wants to transcend where it currently is at. Mm-hmm. And in order for women to be set free from this idea that they are the other in relation to man, man also needs to be set free from the idea that femininity is inherently weak. So I think when a man can understand that when he feels something and he wants to cry or he loves deeply, these are not weaknesses and they do not make him less of a man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And he can actively choose within himself to lean into all of those things. And by living his life in that way, aligned with his, out with himself and living with integrity to that he will cause a ripple effect that will then change what it means to be a man mm-hmm. perfect so yeah. um so just a quick question because where you know um there's a lot of parents out there um that they want like the thing is they don't talk enough about education of like sex I mean they do at school sexuality sexuality at school um that's something that they don't open up at all when do you think is a right age to talk to your kids about that is there even a right age what age do they start to get a sense of themselves I don't even know I didn't get a sense of myself since since like two years ago Like, right, right, but no, no, yeah. that's but that's an evolution. But what age do they start to learn respect? What age do they feel love? I mean, what are we really asking here? Are we asking when can our when can we corrupt them? When's too young to learn about what? Like, I understand. I understand. This is the thing. I don't know the answer to this question. I'm really interested in in the exploration of this question with no need to reach a grand a grand conclusion this is the dismantling of these ideas right mm-hmm. the fact that you and i are well, the fact that three of us are having this conversation right now about what age is the right age means that we understand that what's been done is no longer working mm-hmm. yeah no for sure i mean for giselle and i that was not even a topic of conversation not at all at no. home at school and i f- and I, like I said, I can only speak for my own experiences. And that's probably why through my own self-development and awareness that I started really opening to who I was becoming as a woman, not just sexually, but things that I enjoy, but also transpired to things that I enjoy sexually because um, I was exploring it and learn and uh, researching probably of things and pr- and also bringing people in my life that could match that energy with me. And that's probably why I didn't have such great relationships because like you said, intuition was kicking in and it's like, it's okay, the sex is great and this. And then um, it comes to a crossroad where it's like, 
it's not enjoyable, even though you thought at the beginning the sex was enjoyable, but it wasn't because you cr- you've come to this crossroad that there's no, that they don't worship you, like what you said, mm-hmm. in that sense where you're yeah. just like, mm. so I feel like we we didn't learn that from growing up. As it, 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 I, I don't want to say late bloomers, but that's just something that it was like very taboo in to our talk culture, yeah. in our culture to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think with, especially when it comes to sex ed, because this is a big, this is a big question. And I'm finding that in a lot of circles right now with, with educators, for instance, it is like, when is, when is the time to talk to kids about these things? And it's like, you can still teach your child respect for themselves and for others without having to say that it's intrinsically tied to sex and sexuality. Of course, yeah. Right, like you can teach the other aspects of what it means to be a good person, which will then translate into how they approach sex and sexuality Mm -hmm. to the best of your ability because we also have to acknowledge that there is the internet and every child that they interact with is going to have a different experience Yeah, and the conversations they're going to have are largely not going to be with their parents, but what you can do, and I'm not a parent, right? So I might watch this interview and, you know, when I have a child one day and be like, Nicole, you had no idea what the fuck you were talking about. But at the same time, I would like to believe that the answer to this question lies less in when should we teach them about sex and more in how do we teach them about being a good person? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're very big advocates of not okay. raising assholes. Little, little assholes <laughs> and just being a good person yeah. in, in, you know, in general. And mm-hmm. we hate to say that. We don't want to say that about like kids and stuff like that, but sometimes that's just a learned behavior and, or they learned it somewhere or whatever. But mm-hmm. you know, like, I mean, I think that's the biggest fear that Giselle and I have that we don't ever want to raise little assholes because I can speak on my behalf because I was a fucking asshole in like when I was in my younger generation, like younger, not generation. <laughs> when I was younger, I yeah. wasn't the nicest. Yeah. I wasn't, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. so yeah. Um, so I don't know if you saw it today, but we opened up some questions to our followers. So we actually have some audience questions that were given. So I'm just going to ask you those now. Um, okay. So first of all, where can we buy your orgasm book? <laughs> the orgasm book.com. The orgasm book.com. Hear that guys? Yeah. Yep. The orgasm book.com. Awesome. Okay. I'll even sign it for you. Oh, Amazing. Nice. There we go. Okay, so I'm just going to throw it out here for any viewers out there. We're going to um we're going to run a little contest and we'll give out Nicole's book and it'll be signed cuz Nicole just said she would. Yeah. Um and for couples, <laughs> or, so another question is for couples that are that have been together for a long time, what advice do you have on keeping things exciting and how couples can learn new things about each other and their bodies? Oh, interesting. Yes. Um, hmm. oh. Esther Perel puts this so beautifully when she says, um, desire needs air, or sorry, desire needs space like fire needs air. And when you're, when you, when you've been with somebody for a long period of time, there's that, that, that tension um, kind of goes away. And, Tension can be built in many ways. Um, tension can be built through the fear that you might lose them. Tension can be built through the mystery that there's something about your partner that you don't yet know. Tension can be built from distance, which is like COVID has definitely made that difficult for couples. But I think the really interesting thing that you can do if none of those are available to you are being other people. So what I mean by that is One, you can either experiment with having an open relationship um, and approach that as a team, you know, that you talk to other people and flirt with other people and it never Mm -hmm. has to lead to anything, but you can kind of flirt with other people together and that's a lot of fun. Or you can role play. And I know that this, so when I say role play, a lot of people cringe because they think of it as acting. Oh, I can't do that. Yeah. 
my partner will know and see right through me. That's impossible. Mm -hmm. But something that I've really learned, especially through practices of um, dom sub dynamics, is you can get into a trance like state. And what that means is you're not pretending to not be you. But what you can pretend is that you're meeting each other for the first time as you are. So something that my partner and I did was we went on a date. And when we went on this date and we sat across the table from one another, we pretended it was our first date as we currently are, where you actually talk about your relationship as if it wasn't a different relationship. Yeah. You talk about your day as if they don't know everything about it already. You get curious about who that person is in this moment as if you're meeting them for the first time. So it feels less like acting and more just like rediscovering. And that might be the first step into role-playing, which, again, is not you pretending to be something you're not, but it's you allowing yourselves to discover something new about each other without holding one another to what you already know. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, totally. Because yeah, I sure. feel like when people say role-play, they think, like, going to the, par the bar, picking me up. And yeah. Then, and then the sex Just happens. the whole acting thing. You know, like, the whole acting. I don't mm -hmm. think that's what it is I feel like that leads to that eventually because I don't know I just think it is but I think the rediscovering each other um because there's probably things you don't learn about your partner that you never really asked because you didn't really role play mm -hmm. yeah and ask them about you as if you're not you right like pretend that your relationship that you had you ended you broke up you're now on a date with this person as they are. And like, you can talk about that relationship as if it had happened already. And it's kind of fun. And, um, again, like that's a more intricate way of going about it. Another yeah. thing is really just giving each other space. There is so much potency in simply missing your partner. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know? Um, okay, so next question is, because since we're a mom podcast, we receive these questions from moms, obviously. Um, and you talk a lot about how um, being in tune with your own body. So the question is, how do you keep the sex alive during pregnancy when the mother would just want some, just want some, but her body aches and her boobs are tender? <laughs> oh, erotic massage. Absolutely, right? Like, sex. We, ha we, we have to, or what I hope for is that our views of sex expand, where it's not such a narrow scope of, I want this thing, but I can't have this thing because I feel this way. What you're experiencing is an opportunity to rediscover other erotic areas of your dynamic and of your body. So let's say that you're not feeling that great in your body or that you don't want to be penetrated. Communicate this with your partner and ask them to discover new ways to touch you and turn you on. And that mm -hmm. could be through sensation. It can be through erotic massage. It could be the power of laying back on the bed and spreading your legs and have your partner stare at your pussy and just tell you how beautiful it is and how much he loves it. But make the decision ahead of time that he's not going to touch it. He's just going to use his words and shower you with affection with his words. You know how powerful that is? Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful, beautiful space to be in. It should not be looked at as a hindrance or a challenge, mm -hmm. but an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, so one last question is, yes. actually, this question's coming from me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So as women, like, as a mom, obviously, your body changes through, um, like, a shitload of stuff. You know, your boobs sag, you get a, your stomach, your, their skin hanging, everything else. So... What advice can you give to men when they're in either a romantic relationship or just whatever um, of how to help women get through their insecurities when they're being romantic or like um, without making the woman feel like they're thinking about that one thing they hate about their body? It's not your partner's responsibility to make you feel good about yourself. Okay. And I know that's hard, but to put that amount of pressure on your partner to help you overcome your insecurities means that it's always going to rely on something external. 
if you can look at yourself in the mirror and remind yourself that you are a beautiful, life-carrying being, and that you, I write this in the book, you have the universe between your legs, you are the creator of all things. Your pussy, your pleasure is a source of power. If you can remind yourself of this, then you're not relying on external forces when, again, the answer is within you. Now, that's not to say that your partner can't help you on that journey. But to say, how does he make me not feel insecure, is, say, is, is, is giving up your power. Mm-hmm. You're disempowering yourself when you can do that and you need to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Damn, I, got alone. I, I got a lot of work to do nicole I, i'm well, gonna put you on my speed I, dial I, I know har said that was the last question but i actually have a one final final question i promise or my best friend's gonna kill me if i don't ask you um are she asks are sphinx cats cuddly <laughs> do you have brain there the with you cuddly. No, oh my gosh, it's so funny. Brain's actually at my park house right now chasing mice. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, yeah. He, uh, think, think cats are the most cuddly, mostly because they require a lot of body heat, but you can convince yourself it's because they love you so much. Gotcha. Thank yeah. you so much for answering that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Well... I get oh so we are actually out of time. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nicole, okay. Thank you, for Nicole. coming on and yeah. with all our technical difficulties. So you've definitely given a, given us a lot of information. Mm-hmm. So don't forget to follow all of her handles: is uh, girls who say fuck, men who takes baths, and Nicole Double L. Nicole Double L, love that. And also, don't forget yeah. her book: it's orgasm dot com. The or- the, or- the orgasm book. The orgasm yeah. book. And we will be giving away a free copy, a free signed copy from Nicole. And I'll make sure that when I actually read it, it's not like Harleen's version, but I always like to put a flare. <laughs> so thank you so much, Nicole. We thank really you, appreciate Nicole. it. Well, that's it for us today. Uh, thank you for our sponsors over at Tiger Milk. We love you guys. Thanks for the shirts. Um, if you're an entrepreneur or business looking to um, enhance your brand, slide right into their DMs on Instagram. It's at tgrl.mlk at Tiger Milk. So thank you again, Nicole. Um, Remember guys, don't forget to share, click and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We appreciate all your love and support. Um, And as usual, don't forget to wash your hands, wear your masks and love yourself even on the hardest days. Bye Bye. everybody.